afternoon and welcome to this British Academy event. My name is Jonathan Derbyshire. I'm Executive Opinion Editor of the Financial Times. The British Academy is the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. It's an independent fellowship of world-leading scholars, a funding body that supports new research nationally and internationally, and a forum for debate and engagement. Our event this afternoon is part of the series Thinkers for Our Time, in which we rethink the life and work of influential figures from across the humanities and social sciences, particularly history and the arts. Previous events in this series uh, have explored Sigmund Freud, Christina Rossetti and Charlie Chaplin. And today we turn our attention to one of the most important and influential civil rights activists and intellectuals of the 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois, arguably best remembered as a campaigner and a sociologist. Du Bois is also celebrated as a historian, philosopher, writer of fiction, editor, pioneer in the field of data visualization, and much else. Over the course of the next hour, our expert panel will reflect on his extraordinary life and legacy. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three speakers. Professor Hakim Adi is Professor of the History of Africa and the African Diaspora at the Univers University of Chichester. Professor Paul Goodwin is Chair of Contemporary Art and Urbanism at the University of the Arts London and an independent curator. And Professor Sharon Monteith is Distinguished Professor of American Literature and Cultural History at Nottingham Trent University. So we'll speak in conversation for around 40 minutes before opening up the discussion to questions from you, the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A tab on your screen. And if your question is for a particular panelist, please indicate who. So let's begin. Um, I'm keen if the panel could begin by reflecting on Du Bois's early life as a student and academic. He received his doctorate in history from Harvard in 1895 before entering academia with roles at Wilberforce, Pennsylvania and Atlanta, where he took up a, his, a, a professorship in history, sociology and economics between 1897 and 1910. I'd like to ask each of you what particularly interests you about this early period in his life. Who would like to start? Sharon, perhaps you'd like to kick us off. Um, thank you. I think one of the things that interests me is just before that, he's an undergraduate student at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's the first time in his, in his life that he's not a member of a black minority. And he found fellowship and community at Fisk. Um, he'd been the only black student in his school in, in Massachusetts, in Great Barrington. And, and I think there's a, a signal difference between that experience at Fisk and what he went on to in the way that you've just described. So I think he was lonely at Harvard. Um, I know one professor ousted a white student, a white Southern student from his seminar because he refused to sit next to Du Bois. And um, like Paul Robeson later, and with heavier irony, um, he was refused entry into the university's glee club. So I think despite being the first person to um, achieve a, a first African-American to achieve a doctorate at Harvard, uh, working with William James and George Santana and um, Adam Hart, who was his supervisor, who obviously um, thought thought of him on the in equal terms in terms of his intellectual rigor I can't help but think that there was a bitter aftertaste too um, from that experience thank you Sharon Paul or Hakim do you want to come in yeah I mean um <clears throat> in terms of the bitter aftertaste that Sharon mentioned Du Bois uh, in 1896 in 1896 was invited to by the University of Pennsylvania to conduct a study of the Seventh Ward in Philadelphia, which was um, an area of a large proportion of African Americans um, within the city, a fairly prosperous northern city, um, where <clears throat> much of the crime, or the supposed crime that was taking place in the city, was concentrated in that ward. And of course, you know, the African American community, um, obviously, recently out of slavery. Um, there were multiple pathologies, 
and other forms of um, deprivations, economic deprivations that were happening. But the oh, the city, um, if you like, the city burghers, the city leaders, very much saw that this was the overwhelming problem of the of crime in the in that community, and they wanted to basically do a micro study of that neighbourhood and invited Du Bois, um, as his reputation was starting to grow, um, to come in and do a, a study of that area. Now, what the bittersweet element is that he was not appointed as a professor or or, or kind of a regular title; he was appointed appointed by the title of assistant in sociology, which was a new title. Um, du Bois was very aware, as he wrote in his autobiography, um, about the kind of slight that he received in that, and he was very concerned about that. But nevertheless, really in, really kind of invested um, an incredible amount of time and energy in really doing a kind of um, a forensic analysis of the economy, so sociology or the morals of the community, the black community in that neighborhood. And it was estimated that he undertook 80, 835 hours of door-to-door interviews in over 2,500 households. And there were about six, six and a half thousand, seven thousand um, black people in, in that neighborhood. He literally knocked on doors to ask and to, to, to ask questions from a questionnaire and was only, only refused um, quite a few times. Um, the, the result was the monumental study, the Philadelphia Negro, which appeared in 1899, um, which was really now has come to be seen much later as uh, probably the first major study of American sociology. Um, and for my own, my own, for my own self, I came across that work when I was studying, um, looking at kind of black urbanism and the relationship between blackness and cities. Um, and it had initially been brought to the work of Robert, uh, Robert Park in Chicago in the 1930s and 40s, which is seen as the origin of American sociology. And of course, Du Bois, Du Bois's study uh, much earlier was always, have, has always been kind of neglected until relatively recently. So this study, I think, was really important because it, um, it kind of prefigured much of the politically engaged scholarship that Du Bois engaged in um, later on. And I think pre also showcased two of the main strands of, inter of intellectual engagement during this really important formative period. Firstly, the scientific study of the so-called Negro problem. So he really established the Negro, the idea of the Negro as a problem for study, or in the words of Nahum, Nahum Chandler, as a problem of thought, an intellectual problem, which, it, which was, it was seen to be mostly a kind of a social problem or moral problem. But Du Bois wanted to, use the study of the Negro, um, obviously the, the way that it was talked about then, as a way of kind of showcasing the emerging discourse of sociology with which he was one of the you know, um, leading lights. And the second strand of his thought at that time, I think, was around the appropriate political responses to um, that problem. In other words, a kind of a, a political interventionist approach, which I think he developed later. Hakim, I want to bring you in in a moment, but Paul, if I could just follow up, that's fascinating. Um, did Du Bois see what he called and what you were just, uh, calling the, the Negro problem as principally a problem of urban Blacks in the American North, or was he thinking about the predicament of um, um, Black Americans to core, so including Blacks in the rural South? Absolutely, of course, yes. I mean, he, he was very, obviously, Concerned with the, the with the South, um, obviously studying in Fisk, one of the um, black universities in the South, and also um, in Atlanta um, and in Georgia, where he he as you know he was a professor. He was very much concerned with that. He was concerned, I think, with both the North and the South, but ultimately, I think he was concerned with this. I mean, Du Bois operated both on a local national and international level. I mean, his global understanding of the Negro problem is something um, which is very important. His, his dissertation at Harvard was about the suppression of the African slave trade. Um, so he had always understood the Negro problem, not just as a question of the North or the South, but as a, a national and international problem that needed to be understood. And was a, was a, was an, what, he saw it as an, amazing, an important case study for humanities and social sciences at that time. Mm and understood using the analytical tools of what was then a nascent discipline, sociology. Absolutely. 
Um, Hakim, um, Du Bois is perhaps his best known seminal book, The Souls of Black Folk, was published shortly after The Philadelphia Negro in 1903. Um, and the introduction to that book famously proclaims that the problem of the 20th century, and this um, echoes what Paul was just saying about the international dimension um, of Du Bois's work, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. How original a thinker was he, do you think? Well, I think that, I think the important thing, and just following on from what Paul has said, I think the important thing about Du Bois is that he, I wouldn't say he establishes, but he certainly kind of cements the the idea or the practice of what today would be called scholar activist or activist scholars, that he's not um, content to remain in the so-called ivory tower, but he's concerned that those who are intellectuals or academics should also contribute to addressing the the problems that the problems of society if you like or the problems that individuals in society face so he obviously wasn't the first to speak about the color line which was i suppose referred to by frederick Douglass as well as by by others but um what what was in there were a number of things that were important one is the the kind of internationalism if you like of that concept that it wasn't something just related to the US or even related to people of African origin necessarily, but um, he saw it as part of the, a kind of global problem of racism between, he would have said, the, the lighter and darker races. I think the, the other thing about the, the phrase is that it wasn't used for the first time in that, that particular rendition of it in the souls of the black folk but was famously uttered in london in 1900 during the first pan-african conference where that conception formed part of the address to the nations of the world which was an address issued by the first pan-african conference in by a, a committee we can say chaired by du bois so i i like to think that that concept was not only du boisian but was shaped by his interactions with others in a kind of wider um in a wider pan-african movement and the, i mean the other thing about the the souls of black folk is it it kind of illustrates the depths of not only the boys kind of activism or scholar activism but as we've already touched on that he's he's multidisciplinary in his approach to the particular problems of the day and obviously one of the key problems of the day is is racism as as it manifested itself in the US but also in internationally and the the violence of uh the violence of that racism uh, in particular but he uses a number of um different disciplines sociology history particularly um he looks at different aspects of society the kind of studies that paul's talked about he's concerned with also with various cultural questions and cultural issues and linking african americans to, to africa which is uh, again was not uncommon but he made a particular um effort to do that and of course many of the many of the issues that were raised in the souls of black folk were were developed further in in other work and other studies and particularly the historical work which he undertook looking at the position of african americans in what was then would have been seen as american history was developed later in much further in in black reconstruction which was another very significant book sharon did you want to come in on, on that because both paul and hakim have argued that um what we one of the things we see in the souls of black folk is Du Bois, as it were, inventing or at the very least pioneering a model of activist scholarship. I think he does many things in that book. One of the things that he does is he defies genre expectations. So he also pioneers what we now call a kind of hybrid text. So when we read something like Claudia Rankin's Citizen, um, we think about 
these texts that are both personal and analytical subjective history is is kind of one of the um, themes that they mine. And he brought together his interdisciplinarity in terms of his historical knowledge, his work as a sociologist, but also as a philosopher. You know, so when he's thinking about the concept of double consciousness, which he also does in that book, it's a kind of Hegelian dialectic. He's bringing it through Emerson, but he's making it his own. And he has this facility, really, for coining axioms and creating imagery, which would resonate down the decades um, and, and still resonates. So I think that he did that in that book. But I think the other thing that he did that's really important is that some people thought that it was a dangerous book for African-Americans to read. And one of the things that he does is he intervenes in historiography and he changes it. So in The Souls of Black Folk, he creates a revisionist history of the Freedmen's Bureau. So he says it's not just a kind of experiment in racial uplift. And I think that's definitive of, of who he was as a writer. So um, Paul mentioned um, Black Reconstruction, published in 1935. And that really was an intervention in the historiography, because although Du Bois's version of the Reconstruction era from the end of the Civil War to around 1877, um, as a splendid failure and an unfinished revolution is the way that we think about it now. At the time, the dominant version of Reconstruction was that of the Dunning School, which was a group of white academics at Columbia University for whom Reconstruction was a failure because African-Americans were incapable, they argued, of um, leadership at civic, um, local or national, federal levels. So he really took them to task. And I think he also exposed the kind of caricatures, these kind of deleterious stereotypes of African-Americans in Reconstruction for how they continued to be used thereafter um, by certain white historians who he was, he was writing against. Sharon, I wonder if I can just pursue a couple of um, threads in, in what you've said. Um, so Du Bois said that he worked, and I'm quoting, to make a name in science, to make a name in literature, and thus to raise my race. So if I understand what you were saying correctly, there is a, an intimate connection then between the mode of his academic practice and um, the changes he wanted to bring about. I think so. I think, I think although, I mean, he, he did all the things Paul said in terms of pioneering sociology as a discipline. It didn't exist in, in 1894, he tried to introduce it at Wilberforce, but he was expected to teach languages. And, you know, it wasn't until he went on to, to do the study of the Philadelphia Negro that, you know, he could really make a difference in that discipline. But I also think that he came to realise that presenting facts would not be enough to create a sea change in white supremacist views. So, um, you know, I think he imagined to begin with that his own elite education, his scholarship and the way that he showcased it would, would make a difference in a way that people would understand that there really was no difference intellectually between blacks and whites in that moment. And when he failed, I think he, he went, he looked to other genres. And I think that he did say at one point that um, it was after the lynching of Sam Hose in, in 1899 when Du Bois was in Atlanta and he was on his way to the office of the Atlanta Constitution newspaper to kind of lodge a, an article of complaint when he discovered that um, Mr Hose's knuckles were being displayed in a grocer's window nearby after his lynching. And, and he turned back and he described it as a red rage that welled up in him. And he said, you know, science is not enough. It, it's not enough to, to stop this lynching. So I think that 
he was always looking to other things, getting up and away from his desk, as as Hakeem said. But he was also trying to pursue how to how civil rights could be won through the different activist writing and the different genres that he, he chose to pursue as well. So one of the emerging themes of this discussion is the extraordinary breadth of his activities. Now, um, another, uh, he was particularly active in what today we would call data visualization. Um, and Paul, you co-curated an exhibition called W.E. Du Bois Charting Black Lives at the House of Illustration in 2019-20 which shone a light on this area of his work, which is only, I think, becoming better known, in, has only become better known in recent years. Could you tell us a bit more about this, this aspect of his work? Certainly, Jonathan. I mean, just to take up Sharon's point about um, the fact that Du Bois was understanding at that point that science was not enough. This, re- the, he, under, he, he started to think about how scientific ideas could be, um visualized could be used as propaganda so he became he was very interested in the idea of propaganda because he understood that the dominant narratives about the american negro um up in that going coming drawing from european and american racial pseudoscience um was very much um produced these grotesque stereotypes that completely misrepresented um the way the, the realities and the complexities of black life um, in the South and, 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 and elsewhere. And so he saw, uh, when he was asked by Thomas J. Calloway, who was a, a, an ex-schoolmate of his um, at Fisk University, and who was an educator himself, who worked with Booker T. Washington, um, and who was, um, um, at that point, um, looking to produce an exhibition in Paris as part of the American delegation for the Paris Universal Exhibition, Ex- Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900, Fisk turned to Du Bois um, to help to assemble this um, exhibit around, the, around, the, around the, the American Negro. And of course, so Du Bois really jumped at that as an attempt to do exactly what Sharon said, which is to take it out, is to kind of think about it sociologically, but to kind of think about how that sociological understanding of the Negro, that scientific understanding, objective understanding of the Negro could be transplanted into an exhibition form. Mm-hmm. And to and through the use of, um, of, of, of data. Now the data that he assembled um, with his team of graduate students at Atlanta University um, as part of the Atlanta conferences where he, where every year there were at Atlanta University for a number of years, um, from around the 1890s to around just after about 1910 or 1907, there were a yearly conferences, which Du Bois um, and his team focused on a particular aspect of black American life in the South, um, such as the family, business, um, 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 agriculture, et cetera, housing conditions. And much of that data, which was collected by by sort of black knowledge producers that Du Bois worked with at the, in the university, he collected into this this, um, this exhibit that um, he, that he um, went to Paris. Now, the exhibit itself um, was included as part was actually not part of the so the America, America President McKinley had a, 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 um, belatedly agreed for. America to be to do a, a, a presentation at this um, this world exhibition, which was really about celebrating at the end of the nineteenth century, the close of the nineteenth century, really about celebrating the achievements um, of Europe and 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 the and the Western world in the fields of science and um, social and social progress and humanities, um, and um, the the idea Du Bois sorry. Um, Callaway and um, and others and Booker T. Washington had kind of petitioned for an American, for an African American or, or a Negro exhibit to be to be placed as part of that. It was actually put into the Palace of Social Economy, not as part of the main American thing. But and also, Du Bois only had four months to gather an incredible amount of information. Now, what he did was to gather um, in in terms of the data portraits, the visual portraits, he, 
he basically made charts, maps, um, and graphs depicting nearly every aspect of African American life in a very, um, you know, incredibly avant garde way. So he used um, pie charts, um, graphs, bars, and that really were kind of at the forefront of experimentation. He wasn't the first um, to use these kinds of um, methods. There were other there were other methods that he that that there were other people that had actually worked on 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 these kinds of things. Florence Nightingale, for example, had had done um, work around data visualization in her studies um, in in um, in the Crimean War. But um, Du Bois really brought them together use of color. This is before the the of course the the Cubist Revolution in Paris, which introduced these kind of modernist aesthetics. It was, and if you look at some of these data charts that we showed in this exhibition, um, they very much looked like abstract um, um, art. So he, 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 was really, he was really concerned with the, the visual power of, uh, or the power of the visual to mm. convey the complexity of black life. He also included albums of photo, over 400 photographs of every aspect of African-American life and also he was attentive to the different skin colors, the different, the variety of the Negro types. It was called the types of Negro life. And again, he was trying to counter the stereotype of African-Americans as being, as being the same. So there was a kind of graphical, um, statistical component to the show, but there was also a visual component to the show through, through the photographs. And that's what we showed in the exhibition. That's, that's fascinating. Um, Hakim, um, Paul's been telling us about uh, du Bois's involvement in the Paris Exposition of 1900. I want to um, pursue the question of his internationalism. Um, so du Bois travelled a lot throughout his life. He became active in the um, Pan-Africanism, Pan-African movement, attending the first Pan-African conference, which I think you mentioned earlier in London in 1900. Um, can you tell us about the the scope and extent and, and influence um, of his activity in the Pan-African movement and his influence on it? Well, I think it's very important. I mean, Du Bois is sometimes referred to, perhaps not entirely correctly, as the, the father of Pan-Africanism. Um, we could say, actually, the, the originator of modern Pan-Africanism was a woman. So uh, if you'd really be talking about the mother of Pan-Africanism. But, but in his case, he played an important role in the, the 1900 conference, as I mentioned earlier. And then he went on in particular to develop a whole series of Pan-African Congresses, beginning in 1919 in, in Paris, then another in 1921 in, in London and Brussels, a third in London and Lisbon in 1923, and a fourth in New York in, in 1927. So. There's 19 years between the London Conference and the, the 1919 Paris Congress, uh, which kind of indicates that not that Pan-Africanism had, had died, but that it was perhaps at a, a kind of low ebb in, in terms of uh, its organized character. And so Du Bois really, we can say, resuscitated it as, a, as a, an organizational force in, in 1919. And again, kind of put Pan-Africanism on the map um, at that time. The, the 1919 Congress was specifically concerned with the, the aftermath of the, the First World War and reflected the views of Du Bois and others that Africans or those of African descent should have some say in the, the post-war settlements, just as so many people of African descent had contributed to the war, given their lives during the war and so on. And they should then have some say in what happened, particularly in relation to, to Africa and African colonies that um, you will recall there was a, a discussion about what should happen to African colonies, particularly those belonging to, uh, to, to Germany. And the view of Du Bois and others was that uh, a new kind of super African state should be created to be administered by educated Africans. So people, people like him. So that was the, 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 the aim of that Congress. And then to gather together educated Africans from different parts of the world to, to deliberate on these questions, as well as on the question of the, the global color bar and what could be done about it. 
Um, and of course, much later in his life, in, in 1961, he went into self-imposed exile in, in Ghana and became a Ghanaian citizen in 1963, shortly before his death. And now that exile um, followed a period of increasing disillusionment with the land of his birth, um, Sharon. And this also coincided with a, um, a gravitation towards uh, communism. I wonder what you could say a bit about that political development in his thinking and his commitments. Um, well, he was hounded throughout the, the 1950s, really, hounded for being a communist, even though he didn't actually become a member until 1961, and very publicly, as you say, two years before he died. Um, in, the 19, in 1951, the American Labour Party, um, at their behest, he started to run for the US Senate. And at the time, Langston Hughes, the poet, said, um, somebody wants to put Du Bois in jail. And it was at that time that um, he was indicted as a spy for Russia. So part of his internationalism and his pan-Africanism, the fact that he traveled so much, the fact that he um, espoused socialism and was interested in labor, workers' rights and the peace movement at this time as well, um, put him in the spotlight, which was on the one hand where he wanted to be, but on the other hand, um, I think this was, this was thoroughly ruining for Du Bois at this moment. So he was uh, arraigned, indicted and released. But if he'd been um, found guilty, he could have been jailed for five years and would certainly have got a $10,000 fine, uh, a lot of money at that point. And I don't think he could quite believe that it had happened to him. Um, so his faith in democracy at that point and in the, uh, the justice system individually um, waned significantly. I think the other thing was that people that he had um, expected to support him, so the talented 10th that he championed earlier in his life, were conspicuously silent and all the invitations to universities dried up. Um, I think it wasn't until 1958 that Howard University changed that by inviting him back. So his reputation was ruined. And he, he felt that although he made new friends and found out who his supporters were, um, he, he really lost his reputation for leadership at that point. So I think throughout the 1950s, really, um, he really, at the point that the civil rights iteration of the 1950s and 60s was building, um, he was really very disappointed and and kind of in the background of what was going on at that point. Um, so when he began to see African-Americans gaining recognition for civil rights initiatives in the 1950s and 60s. He was also sceptical. So when the Brown versus Board decision came down to desegregate schools, um, he rightly predicted the kind of violent backlash of massive resistance and, and how long that would continue. And he wrote um, very painfully of what a long history America had of ignoring the laws that it had passed and breaking them. So I think by the time he he's, he's in the 1960s, that visit to Ghana was very important. And in 1957, he'd been disallowed for attending from attending the um, the ceremony for Ghana's independence, and he'd been invited as a special guest, but his passport had been revoked. And he couldn't attend, and it wasn't given back to him until 1958, the year after. So, so then he travelled. He went to China, and he ended up in Ghana, and mm. you know continued to to work there on his Encyclopedia Africana. So I think he found in Pan Africanism in that moment, and also in communism. You know, he joined very publicly, a way of expressing his lack of faith in in America in that moment. Um, du Bois was honoured after his death by Martin Luther King in a speech in 1968, so shortly before Dr King's um, murder, on what would have been his 100th birthday. 
and he's widely considered to be one of the architects of, or in, certainly key intellectual influences on um, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Um, can his influence also be traced through to the Black Lives Matter movement today? Hakeem or Paul, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. You go ahead, Paul, and then I'll say Paul, something. Yeah, no, I think absolutely, absolutely can, it can be completely traced through firstly in terms of as we both Hakim and myself has, and, and Sharon have talked about the global nature of race um, as a central kind of dividing line, fault line um, is something that has been taken up in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and of course, and also I think the second thing is around the focus on the status of black life, the kind of ontology of blackness, the, the sense of um, what, it, what it constitutes to be black, the condition of being black, which Du Bois, of course, famously unpacked in the Plaza of Black Folk, but also in the exhibition that I mentioned in Paris, um, where he looked at the complexity of black life in the images and also in the in the in the statistics and the graphics. Um, so I think that in terms of much of the driving intellectual activism that's been happening in in, in all over the world that was inspired by uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And even the even the, the term itself, Black Lives Matter, um, it, it, it kind of, these are the issues that Du Bois really opened up. You know, as I mentioned before, the Negro is a problem for thought, the black, the, the, the status of blackness um, um, and how that um, impacts um, current life. And of course, his, his model of the intellectual and activist is something which I think is very much um, part of the Black Lives Matters um, um, movement at this time. Thank you. Yeah, I, would, yeah. I was going to say something very similar. I mean, I think that the stands that he took over such a long period of time are, you know, the, the you could say it's we're basically looking at the same problem of in in Du Bois' day it was a question of various forms of. Um, terrorism in the form of lynching and so on. Uh, today, we're looking at various forms, particularly of state violence, particularly in the US, but also more more broadly. Um, so people are taking a stand against a, a similar kinds of problems. And all those who've gone before who've taken a similar stand are, um, you could say, are an inspiration to to those who take a stand today, and I think that's that's one of the the characteristics of Du Bois through his life that he wasn't afraid of taking that stand, even if it was uh, unpopular. And I think a lot of the the work that he did, the political work, the activism of the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, may may have been unpopular with some, and certainly with the powers that be. But Du Bois was prepared to take, you know, his defense of the Rosenbergs, for example, in the US, um, his connection with the, the communist movement generally, um, and even his earlier statements about the Soviet Union and so on from the 1920s onwards. He took a stand and he sometimes he may have changed his views, but he wasn't afraid to stand up for what he thought was right. And I think that's a, a very important quality and certainly the quality of what that we've seen in, in Black Lives Matter uh, today. So I think he's a, you know, he's an important a role model for, for all of us, particularly for academics, I would say, mm. um, that as a, as I said before, as a, an academic intellectual, your work is not just in the classroom or in writing books, but actually to, as somebody once said, not just to interpret the world, but uh, to change it. Indeed. I want to bring the um, turn to the audience questions in a moment, but a question for each of you, if you can respond briefly, which is, um, where do you think the reception and study of Du Bois is heading? How, how is our understanding of his work uh, changing and evolving, if it is? Sharon, maybe you want to start with that. Um, I think connecting back to um, what Paul and Hakeem have said, um, current activists are not as presentist as they're sometimes presented in the press. And it's always been a long struggle. And one of the ways in which um, 
people have tried to divide it just to say that that it's not the same struggle, that this is a new iteration when it's actually the same long African American freedom struggle. And I think that's where Du Bois sits, because in Black Reconstruction, he coined the term abolition democracy. And that is very, very current at the moment. He coined it in the context of Reconstruction, that the ending of chattel slavery could not alone um, create a democracy, but there needed to be a reconstruction of all um, American institutions, the social justice system, um, the prison complex. And he did that in the in the context of the criminalization of African Americans that followed bringing in those black codes um, through the South to, um, to roll back reconstruction gains. And if you look at how abolition democracy is used now, Andrew Davis took it as the title for a book and amplified it. But in the work of um, prison and justice activists like um, James Foreman Jr. or Brian Stevenson, um, Michelle Alexander, you can see that Du Bois's ideas permeate through. They're still incredibly current. And, you know, just as, as we were, I was listening there, I was thinking, you know, yesterday, the, the verdict in the Ahmad Arbery trial. I mean, you cannot conceive of the difficulties in the justice system. That was a relief, that verdict. But the machinations of his defence lawyers in the, in the courtroom make it very clear that you know one cannot automatically expect a fair trial not then and and not now so you know his his abolition democracy is an unfinished revolution and i think that the young activists in black lives matter um young and older um who call on um lots of groups the black panthers snick in whom they find mentors ella baker but also Du Bois, they, they, they're they very, very aware that this is the tradition in which their activism is working now. So um, he's incredibly important, I think, and still is. And the more we think and talk about him, the more we begin to kind of realise how his ideas have percolated through and are still current. Paul, Hakim, I, I assume you would um, endorse what Sharon's just said about the urgency of his influence. Absolutely. I'd, I'd make just two quick points about that. One is um, is his growing importance in terms of black Europe. So, for example, the show that was in uh, London, at the House of Illustration, is now actually currently in Amsterdam um, at a place called the Illustration Embassy. And um, we collaborated in the Amsterdam version of the show with the Black Archive, which is an activist based group. Um, um, which is looking at kind of which hold black archives from the Suriname Museum Workers, Workers Association, which is over 100 years old. Um, and Du Bois visited Amsterdam in 1958, and there was some documentation around that visit. And that visit was a short visit, but it actually had ripples for the Workers Association in in, Suriname, in, in, in Amsterdam in terms of um, its influence, on the way that he inspired them. And so there's material in the exhibition that relates to that particular visit and, and um the impact that's had in in Holland, also in 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 Portugal, where I do a lot of work. Um, du Bois also visited, as as uh, Hakim has mentioned, Lisbon um, very early on, and and that that particular visit, um, again, the ripples effect on that in terms of activism and in terms of the Black Student Movement in Lisbon at that point is now being researched by a number of researchers in in Portugal. So. The kind of geography of Du Bois and his influence in in Europe in terms of influencing black communities and radical movements is something that I think we're still coming to terms with. The second point I think that I, that comes out of my own work in in, in visual culture is Du Bois's relationship to the visual um, and to visual culture and to the, and I, I mentioned it in terms of propaganda um, in the sense that he saw the visual as, a, as an aid for propaganda, but there's more to it than that. Um, and, you know, he's written, he wrote, he didn't write much about art. You know, there was an article in The Crisis um, uh, about, about black art where he talked about black, you know, art is in instrumental terms. But I think if you look at, we, we mentioned, for example, the idea of him as being a, a pioneer of data visualization and the ways that now that's been taken up. 
most recently with the exhibition that I did and also some publications that have come out in the States about Du Bois's work in the area. So I think Du Bois's work on the visual is something that I'm certainly pursuing in terms of research. And I think is also an area that um, I think could be of interest, um, you know, in, as we as we move on. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, one of the other things that comes out of Black Reconstruction is Du Bois' concept of a psychological wage of whiteness, if you like. And clearly today, the whole idea of whiteness and whiteness studies is something which is very, very current. I mean, I think the importance for him was to try and explain why the struggles that went on during the Civil War and the early part of Reconstruction didn't didn't usher in this new democracy that he was concerned about. But I think that that was an important intervention. And the other is his continual concern with, if you like, with class. And again, in Black Reconstruction, about workers of African Americans as predominantly workers, as um, and you know, several of the chapters in that book are specifically about you know white workers or Negro workers. So his concern with what today we would call class and the role of workers in political and social change, I think, is extremely important. And then the other thing, I guess, towards the end of his life, which you alluded to, is his his notion that what currently exists, the kind of society that we live in, the capital-centered society, is not capable of solving these problems of of racism, of inequality, of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that only, as he might have said, only revolutionary solutions are, or fundamental changes concerning people's empowerment are what is going to fundamentally make a difference. So I think these are very important concepts which resonate with people today because we're discussing, as we say, the same problems that Du Bois was discussing in 1900, we're still discussing and trying to deal with 120 years later. So um, despite all the protestations of people that uh, things are, things have got better or things can only get better, um, in terms of this problem of racism and violence against uh, people of African descent in the US and elsewhere, um, the, the problem is still very much there. And so again, people look for, people want to investigate why is this the case? Why is the existing society unable to solve this problem? And what, what else is required to solve it? Well, I think the, the way his ideas resonate is captured in the um, questions from the audience, of which there are several. Let's try and um, deal with as many as we can. There are, interestingly, a number of questions on uh, about Du Bois's relationship to his contemporaries. So Fernando, for example, asks, could you give us a sense of his interlocutors, figures he would consider his equals in his moment of maturity? Where did he find them? Fernando asks. And uh, Hassan also asks, who are Du Bois's contemporaries and how did he interact with them? And a similar one from an anonymous uh, audience member, how was Du Bois's work received by white scholars at the time? So who were his um, favorite uh, intellectual and political interlocutors? And what was the response of the white scholarly community to his work? Who wants to have a go at one or both of those? Sharon, do you want to? Um, well, I think we kind of touched on the white response to his work, partly in terms of him being often seen as a dangerous writer, yeah. uh, a very good thing to be, in my view. Um, and also in terms of the way that he took to task the Dunning School. In terms of his contemporaries, um, Du Bois clashed with quite a lot of people, um, but the, the, the kind of famous clash is always seen to be the one with Booker T. Washington. But to begin with, they were pretty much aligned, I think, um, at the beginning of Du Bois's career. And Booker T. even um, offered him a job at the Tuskegee Institute, um, which in the end he didn't take. Now, whether that was to kind of keep him in Washington's circle um, or to bring him into it, um, is is unclear, but 
I think what Du Bois never did was he never followed any individual. He agreed with Munro Trotter at various points um, when disagreeing with Booker T. Washington. He, um, he was aligned with Paul Robeson for a lot of his life um, and, um, and with different civil rights groups at, at different moments of his life. And I think that's something that we, we have to remember that his contemporaries changed uh, you know, over nearly a hundred years. So he was there at the founding of the fledgling Niagara movement He's there at the beginning of the NAACP in 1909. He's there at the beginning of the, of the Urban League. So in a sense, as he moves through different iterations of the civil rights movement, he both, um, he both works alongside people inside organizations as he did in the NAACP for a number of years, but he also moves as soon as his ideological um, views change or clash. So um, in a sense, there's nobody that he stayed with as a contemporary throughout that long life, I think. Um, I don't know what my colleagues would think, but I do think that with Paul Robeson, that relationship lasted a very long time and that they, they worked together closely and, and, to my knowledge, never really clashed um, or fell away from each other in the way as that happened with lots of his other contemporaries yeah i think that's uh, right i think paul robson is paul robson is another very important figure um who too often is neglected perhaps in certain circles but it's clear that the boys work very closely with robson and others in the council on african affairs and also in various publishing um endeavors which uh, and I think it was an Im important relationship, and no doubt it was a relationship which one of the relationships which um, created the conditions for for the boys to become much closer to the the, the communist movement, partic particularly in the United States. Um, another person that he worked very closely with, although not always harmoniously, was George Padmore, hmm. and. Um, Obviously, in 1945, it was Padmore and others in Britain who organized the, the famous Fifth Pan-African Congress, to which they almost belatedly invited Du Bois. But thereafter, they worked very, very closely together on a number of issues relating to, um, to the liberation of Africa, um, again, over, over the next 14, 15 years until Padmore's death. The other important contemporary of Du Bois is Marcus Garvey, who, again, one could say, to use British understatement, he uh, clashed with at times. Um, and, I mean, I suppose Garvey was, you could say, his main uh, pan-African rival in the, in the sense that Garvey established a, a global organisation a global pan-African organization and was famously, or very, very clearly, omitted from the Pan-African Congress, which Du Bois organized in the in the 1920s. And they there was little love lost between them without going into the insults which they, they traded and so on. But interestingly, their ideas on many things were very similar. And certainly at the time of the 1919 Congress, when when Du Bois was presenting ideas about uh, African colonies being taken under trusteeship and being, um, you know, to some extent put under the jurisdiction of educated Africans such as himself, Agave was saying exactly the same thing. Uh, so th on that, their ideas were similar, and on, on other things, their ideas were not entirely dissimilar, but in terms of uh, of uh, a global pan-African movement, they they certainly they certainly clashed. But I think Sharon is quite right um, in the sense that Du Bois lived a very long time, and so that he kind of outlived almost, or was was he outlived his contemporaries, if you, in, in the sense of those who were born in the nineteenth century. But he he worked with or came into contact with nearly everybody that we can imagine of you know, in the 
important African Americans, but also globally. And I mean, on know, the on the globe on his global reach, um, we have a question from Perna, who asks about um, Du Bois's um, relationship with the um, Indian. Dalit, untouchable uh, scholar and jurist B.R. Um, B. R. Ambedkar. Um, I don't know if any any of you have anything to say about that relationship. No. Nope. Turns out there is um, there's an emerging body of evidence to suggest that they uh, they ex they exchange um, letters and uh, work um, at some point in their lives. Um, It'd be interesting. Let's take one more question. Um, again, on this this internationalist theme, um, Sharon, maybe you want to take this since you mentioned uh, Du Bois's Hegelianism at the beginning of this discussion. So Daniel Abdallah uh, says, I believe Du Bois did graduate study in Germany in the 1890s. Do you think there are any significant European rather than North American currents of thought that he picked up on during this early exchange that continued to influence him? Well, Hegel, certainly. Um, Goethe, um, he read a lot of Goethe. I think that he threads, he threads what he reads and what he studies through, through everything he writes. And um, when he studied in Germany, he, he asked for it to be extended an extra year. And um, that experience was, was his first experience abroad. And it was his first, his first experience of of feeling a two-ness in a different way. So not the kind of double consciousness um, centered on racism that he was feeling in the US, but um, a difference that made him um, interesting to others. And, and he felt that he, he, was, he was seen on equal terms when he was in Germany at the end of the 19th century. Um, I think one of the things that's striking about Du Bois is that He's, he's open to each kind of national culture that he encounters. So um, in terms of Perna's question, you know, he, yes, he's, he's not, it's not only about an African-American context. He's always looking elsewhere. He's always making relationships. You know, the final relationships he has are in Ghana on the African continent. But his pan-Africanism doesn't occlude um, Asian Southeast Asian or South Asian connections that he was making. You know, I've mentioned his visit to China. He was interested in India. So was his wife, um, his second wife, um, Shirley Graham Du Bois. Uh, they were travelers. They, they moved around and they, and they learned from their travels. And um, Germany was, was no exception to that. Well, I'm afraid we are just about out of, uh, out of time, but I think this discussion has given us a really vivid sense of how Du Bois was a model for both transnational and transdisciplinary uh, scholarship and, and activism. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the audience for their questions. I'm afraid we didn't get to deal with all of them, but thank you for your interest. And thank you to Hakeem, Paul and Sharon for a fascinating discussion. And thank you, of course, to you, the audience, for tuning in. Um, do refer to the British Academy's website and social media channels for details about future events, but um, I'm sure you want to thank me and thanking the panel for a fascinating and deeply rich discussion of an extremely significant figure. Thank you very much and good evening. Mm -hmm.